Are you alive? When I visited my son's house, I was stunned by the scene before me. I exclaimed as I stood in my son's house, confronted by a shocking scene. There in the living room was my missing five-year-old grandchild, chained and emaciated. Empty bread bags and discarded plastic bottles littered the room. In my haste, I rushed to give him water, but he urgently protested, give it to my sister first. Your sister? Who is she? I asked, bewildered. Then, from a corner of the room, I heard the feeble cries of an infant. The shocking truth soon became clear. I resolved to thoroughly punish the person responsible for putting my grandchild through such an ordeal. Do you want to lend me money again? I let out an exasperated voice toward my son on the phone. Say, it has been three years since my husband passed away when I was 62. Since then, I've been living alone. I worked for many years, and my husband left me with a substantial inheritance, so I haven't faced financial difficulties. However, my main concern now is my son Thomas, who has already moved out. He has always been careless even after becoming a working adult. He brought work-related items home, overslept, and consistently displayed poor work ethics. His job history was marked by frequent job changes, and he occasionally asked me for financial help. Despite feeling disappointed in my own son, the bond of family ties prevented me from completely giving up on him. One day out of the blue, Thomas came to our house with a woman. Mom, I'm going to marry this girl. Surprised, I greeted the young and flashy woman. Hi, I'm Ain, I replied. Nice to meet you, Ain. But getting married so suddenly, I'm surprised, I said. Thomas chuckled while chewing gum. Well, what can you do when you get pregnant? Then she lightly touched her belly and said, I'm four months pregnant. I was surprised but managed to say, congratulations, as I saw my son and his wife off. Although the order is different, pregnancy is a happy thing. I'm going to have a grandchild, but I wonder if those two can raise a child properly. I had mixed feelings. After some time, I visited Thomas and his family at their home, and I was taken aback. The interior looked as if a burglar had ransacked the place. Empty convenience store meal containers and cup noodle cups were strewn everywhere. I couldn't help but exclaim, What on earth is this mess? And Ain, are you eating properly? It's not just your body now. I bought some vegetables, shall we cook together? In response, my daughter-in-law, who had a slightly larger belly, twisted her face. She retorted, Ah, cooking is such a hassle. As I began to say, but you need proper nutrition, Thomas interjected sharply, an annoying mother-in-law who nags all the time won't be like, you know, stop picking on my wife. I have no intent of doing that. Aileen pushed the vegetables I brought toward me. She added, I really don't need this kind of thing and please refrain from unnecessary comments. You're seriously annoying. With their fierce reproach, I had no choice but to leave quietly that day. Eventually, she gave birth and the two of them came to show me the baby. As I looked at my grandchild wrapped in a swaddle, my face softened. How adorable! It's a boy, right? What's his name? I asked. His name is Harry. But, Mom, you have something to give us, don't you? Oh, um, yes, that's right. It's a small gift for the birth. I handed over an envelope. Ain swiftly snatched it and checked the contents. Tom, there's $1,300 in here, she exclaimed. My son grinned. Awesome, maybe I'll go out and treat myself. I tried to tell my son and daughter-in-law to use the money for the baby, but it seemed they weren't really listening. Then my son looked at me, you know, Mom, with the baby and all, our current home is getting cramped. We're thinking of moving to your vacant house. I had just moved from the house where I lived with my husband to a reasonably priced apartment. At that time, we were considering whether to sell the house or rent it out. 
Certainly, raising children requires money, and perhaps living in a house would allow for more relaxed parenting. With that thought in mind, I nodded. I understand. You'll have to pay rent so you can live there. My son replied, thanks. Should we move next month? However, Ain, who had been listening to everything, interjected. She said to me, but please don't come to our house. I was taken aback and stammered, ha. Thomas continued, we don't want interference, so please leave us alone. I understand, I replied. And so I found myself only able to visit my son and daughter-in-law's house when I had urgent matters. Occasionally, I'd contact them to share food, and during those times, they reluctantly allowed me to meet Harry but it was clear they preferred their privacy. Despite this, my grandchild was growing well, and he even started calling me grandma. But just before Harry turned four years old as usual, when I contacted him saying I want to bring Harry's snack, I received a message from my son. He said, Aileen doesn't want to see you anymore. Stop doing this and don't come to our house. We've changed the lock so you can't get in. I was surprised by his one-sided statement and felt angry. But perhaps I unintentionally offended Ain without realizing it, so I decided to observe the situation for a while. However, in the process, I missed the timing to visit my son's house, and I gradually stopped going altogether. Occasionally, when I contacted Thomas for some reason, I received reluctant and brief responses. Harry is already five years old, isn't he? I hope he's doing well. Despite my worries, I continued living my solitary life. Then one day an unfamiliar number called me. When I answered, the person on the other end said, I'd like to request repayment of your son's debt. Upon further conversation, it became apparent that my son had unilaterally made me a co-guarantor. While I'd been asked for financial help before, I never expected something like this. I immediately tried to contact Thomas, but there was no response. Usually, I'd receive a reply after some time, but this time it was different. Frustrated, I headed to my son's house. I pressed the intercom button, but no one answered. No matter how many times I called, the line remained silent. Even when I changed the time of my visits, the situation remained unchanged. After several days of this, I began to worry. Could they have gone missing? Where are they? I searched for any clues. When I went to Thomas's workplace, they told me he had quit. The neighbors were equally clueless about their whereabouts. A whole week had passed since my initial visit. Considering reporting to the police, I decided to give their house one more try before taking that step. I pressed the intercom but still received no response. The front door remained locked, preventing me from turning it. With a sigh, I was about to leave when suddenly, from inside the house, I heard a faint thud as if something had shifted. I called out desperately, is anyone inside? Show your face, please. But there was no response. However, the sound from inside intrigued me, and I pondered how I could somehow get into the house. That's when I noticed something I hadn't seen during my previous visit. The lock on the garden side casement window was open. With trepidation, I entered and was met with a scene that made me scream in horror. In that situation, five-year-old grandson Harry was crouched and chained. "'Are you alive?' I exclaimed, rushing to his side. The room reeked of decay, and around Harry lay empty bread bags and scattered plastic bottles. He whispered, Grandma, did you come to rescue me? What on earth is happening here? First, let's get you some water. I hurriedly fetched water, attempting to pass it to Harry still bound by the chain. But then he cried out, Give it to my sister first. Your sister? Who's your sister? In the next moment, I heard a feeble cry from the corner of the room, and as I turned my gaze in that direction, I accidentally dropped the cup I was holding. To my astonishment, there lay an about three-month-old baby. 
The shock of discovering this infant's existence overwhelmed me more than the distressing sight of my grandson, Harry. Both Harry and the baby appeared weakened. Desperate to help, I unfastened Harry's chain, placed him and the baby in the car, and rushed to the hospital. The examination results indicated that both individuals are suffering from malnutrition. When the doctor asked, may I inquire about the circumstances, I was unable to respond because I hadn't been involved with my son and daughter-in-law for some time. Harry and the baby are scheduled to be hospitalized for a few days and subsequently, the police arrived after receiving a report from the hospital. When questioned by the police, I honestly conveyed that my son and daughter-in-law were missing. Harry, who was receiving intravenous fluids, was also asked various questions, but he appeared too frightened to say anything. After the police left, I approached my visibly calmer grandchild and asked, where are mom and dad? They said they were going abroad. They packed their big bags and left. Harry began to speak in fragments about the situation. Mimi, my granddaughter, was born about four months ago. I was told we'll keep you tethered to the care of your sister so you won't escape before leaving on a trip. Even if the doorbell rings, I was told not to answer. As I stood there frozen and covering my mouth, my grandchild burst into tears. Mimi had learned to roll over, and during one of Harry's naps, she managed to venture out of his reach. My trembling grandchild confessed, I didn't know what to do and I was so scared. I held him tightly as tears streamed down his face. Once I confirmed that Harry was asleep, I returned to the house where my son's family lived, intending to retrieve their belongings. At that moment, I still harbored a desire to believe in Thomas and his wife. Did they really go abroad, leaving the children behind? It couldn't be true, surely. As I packed the grandchildren's change of clothes into a bag and prepared to leave, my eyes were drawn to a travel brochure placed on the table. The cover bore the words, elegant two-week overseas cruise, and trembling. I picked it up, and from within its pages, slipped a single sheet of paper meticulously detailing the travel plans for just the two of us. The congratulations on surviving childbirth trip. Incredibly, there were words saying the funding source borrowed money with an old hag as a co-guarantor. The moment I realized they had gone on a trip, I was furious. To subject my grandchildren to such hardship and casually go on a vacation, it's inhuman. Whether it's my son or not, I will never forgive them. And so I resolved to punish them thoroughly. Examining their travel plans, it became clear that their return was scheduled for three days later. Without hesitation, I left home and took care of something. Three days later, as I observed from the shadows near their house, Thomas and Ain turned, looking jubilant as they pulled large suitcases. Man, that was seriously fun. The food was delicious, too. Absolutely, it was amazing, Tom. Thank you for taking me. You, I don't want to go back yet. Let's go again soon. As they chatted, turning the corner at the street where our house stood, they froze in shock. Hey, what's going on here? What happened in front of the house? All their belongings had been moved out and stacked up. So that something I mentioned was precisely this. In a state of panic and disbelief, I appeared before the two of them. Did you enjoy your trip? I asked. Thomas looked startled when he saw me. What the heck is going on, old hag? I'm asking if the overseas trip that subjected your own children to such experiences was enjoyable. In response to my angry voice, my son and daughter-in-law momentarily flinched, but then immediately counterattacked. Didn't we tell you not to come near our house? Did you just barge in? I sighed. If I hadn't been involuntarily made a co-guarantor, I wouldn't have gone on. And when I saw that window open, I couldn't resist. Besides, this house is in my name. Is there a problem? Ain's expression changed as if she had been startled. Wait a minute, 
where are the kids? Let us see them, she exclaimed. To which I replied, the children are currently hospitalized. They are being taken care of at the hospital. Unexpectedly, their faces registered surprise upon hearing my answer. You left water and food for them, but the quantity was insufficient. By the time I found them, they had already run out. Given their poor nutritional state, hospitalization was inevitable. I continued sternly. My son and daughter-in-law attempted to say something while glaring at me, but I promptly interrupted them. Furthermore, Mimi has learned to roll over and has managed to move out of Harry's reach while chained. If I hadn't found her in time, she might not have survived. As I spoke, Eileen's expression clearly showed her embarrassment. However, Thomas lashed out, in the end, they're alive, so it's fine. But right now it's about the house. Why are the belongings outside? I declared, I have no intention of letting you, who have committed such despicable acts, live here. I've decided to put this house up for sale, so please leave. Upon hearing this, my son and daughter-in-law were shocked and began berating me. Don't be ridiculous, old hag. Such tyranny won't be at. Exactly enough already. Return the house and the kids. At that moment, I looked directly at my son and said, Thomas, it seems I've made mistakes in raising you. You can't hold down a job. You've burdened your parents as a lone guarantor, and now this. It's truly pathetic. I no longer see you as my son. Thomas, who had fallen silent, glanced sideways. This time I turned toward his wife, Ain. Do you realize how vulnerable those children were? Having five-year-old Harry to take care of your baby, what are you thinking? After subjecting those kids to such trauma, you have no right to call yourselves parents. The couple was rendered speechless by the scathing words. However, my son erupted in blind fury. I don't care. Let us in. This is my home. Well, even if there is a home, you won't be able to return for a while, I replied coolly. Just then, in unison, the son and daughter-in-law exclaimed, What? At that very moment, the distant wail of a police siren drew closer. Did you report us? If so, they've already done it. When your kids were taken to the hospital, the police instructed me to notify them when you returned. So I took care of it earlier, I said matter-of-factly without changing my expression. I watched as my daughter-in-law's face turned pale, and she began to tremble. Tom, what should we do? Are we going to get arrested? I can't bear the thought of dealing with the police, she said. At that moment, Thomas cheerfully clung to me. Mom, please smooth things over for us. Convince them we're innocent. I promise we'll do better from now on, please. Ain, her face streaked with tears and mucus, chimed in, please, I beg you. And so I made my decision, resolute and unwavering. I won't forgive you. Today, I sever all family ties. What you've done to your children is an undeniable crime. Reflect on it and make amends. The son and daughter-in-law slumped in their seats, muttering. But just then, a police car arrived, and I watched with a cold detachment as they were led away. Afterward, Thomas and Ain were interrogated by the police and found guilty. They were detained for a long time, and although they were eventually released, they had no home to return to. I took legal action and obtained custody of my two grandchildren. Despite opposition from my son and daughter-in-law, their behavior was called into question, and ultimately I prevailed. Currently, they have moved far away and are living in a precarious, rundown apartment. Given the news coverage of this incident, it's unlikely they'll find stable employment in the future. Nevertheless, I harbor no sympathy for them. On the other hand, I am wholeheartedly raising my two grandchildren. Harry helps with household chores, and Mimi has started talking and is in her admirable phase. It's a busy life, but thanks to my grandchildren, 
every day feels fulfilling. I'll continue to take care of my health and do my best for these precious grandchildren. How did you find this story? If you enjoyed it, consider subscribing to our channel. Until next time, in our next video.